Welcome. Uh, I'm Catherine Seavitt, Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture here at the Weitzman School of Design. I'm very happy to launch the first of our department's Spring 2024 Now Landscape Lecture Series. And also welcome some of our board members from the Carter Center who are here this evening, Sissy Carroll. Uh, it's wonderful to be here together in this quirky Fisher Fine Arts Library constructed in the 1880s from Philadelphia to Rain, sandstone, brick, and terracotta. And with that landscape in mind, I'll start with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the University of Pennsylvania is situated upon the ancestral homeland and territory of the many Lenape peoples. As members of an educational community, we are obligated to know the histories of dispossession that have allowed the University of Pennsylvania to grow and thrive on this vibrant terrain. As designers and thinkers, we endeavor to build in ways that lead toward justice, and we are committed to working to dismantle the ongoing consequences of settler colonialism. This spring's Now Landscape Lecture Series has been curated by our very own Chris Kessner, who serves as Assistant Professor of Landscape Architecture. He's also a faculty fellow here at the Climate Center for Energy Policy. Thanks to Nick's curation, the three speakers whom you'll meet across the course of the spring semester will each explore, both peripherally and directly, notions of energy futures. This topic is an apt one for Nick, whose research moves fluidly across ecological systems, energy landscapes, and climate policy. He's indeed the design mind we need as we move toward a just and inclusive energy transition. Nick's teaching and research explores options uh, and opportunities for decarbonization across multiple sectors. He investigates the aspects of abstract climate policy and seeks to spatialize the physical and social implications of that policy in our built environment. Meanwhile, considering the necessary practices and certainly the new behaviors that will be necessary for spatial justice. Energy futures, with mixed vibrant colors and unmistakable curatorial touch, <laughs> suggest an optimistic projection forward a hopeful and necessary future that moves beyond the ghosts of our energy pasts, coal, petroleum, and gas extraction and consumption, with the palpable impact of these practices on our atmosphere and climate. And we must reckon not only with the climate impacts of the so-called Great Acceleration, that massive consumption of fossil fuels since the 1950s, but also its entangled Great Divergence, a term coined by the writer Timothy Noah, the widening chasm inequality between the super-rich and the ultra-poor. These grand challenges will require many minds and diverse input and new tools to gather and engage collective minds. We're so delighted to welcome Jeanette Kim this evening to expand upon this idea of tools. Jeanette is joining us from San Francisco, where she's an associate professor of architecture at the California College of Arts. She's co-author of the Underdome Guide to Energy Reform, and co-creator of the brilliant Safari 7 podcast tours. And to that point, I don't think I've seen you as we have been chatting since uh, the very fun Underdome book launch at the uh, many years back. I literally think of you every time I'm on the seven train to Queens. I'm not kidding. Um, so if you don't know Safari 7, look that one up and, and download. So thanks again to everyone for joining us this evening, and a huge welcome to Jeanette. I'd like to now invite Nick Kepsner to the podium to properly introduce us to Professor Jeanette Kim. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, so, as part of this spring lecture series, uh, Catherine had asked me if there was an overarching theme that tied all three of our speakers together this semester. And I thought about it. The work of the three speakers for coming um, for the spring series and across topics of infrastructure and energy transitions, decarbonization, climate adaptation, community empowerment, and various styles of projective design and experimentation. And so we could we could call the spring lecture series any one of those things, but somehow I kept coming back to these two words. And so while the theme title of the overall lecture series is not important at all, um, I quite like it because it resonates, as Catherine said. Um, with some of the topics that I enjoy working on and teaching about energy and futures um, in search of design strategies for coping with our climate crisis. And as the residents um, of our speakers work um, with these topics, uh, their responses to our climate crisis through design of energy transitions to our infrastructures, and their various experiments and projected imagination, 
um, featuring other experiments. This may seem like maybe it's an act one, maybe it was. But while the focus of the research by Jeanette Kim, the speaker tackles other gnarly urban systems besides energy, perhaps I was also subconsciously influenced by the book that Catherine mentioned, The um, Underdome Guide to Energy Reform, which sits right near my desk, the book that Jeanette Kim um, had co authored back in 2013. And so, in the Underdome Guide, Jeanette offered us a whole suite of tools for reconfiguring our energy system, and at the same time, the political organization of our cities and neighborhoods. Carefully curated, precisely illustrated, this collection of tools ran the gamut. Some were historical, some aspirational, some political. But together, it gathered examples of how architecture and infrastructure could play more than merely technical roles in this transition, always coming back to ways that design can influence social, political, and institutional dynamics, always back to power and politics. We can see these themes as well in our climate change workings, such as the game Jeanette developed for the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge, which curated um, a game designed to bring people together to engage in collective decision making around climate risk. All of these projects, projects espouse traits that reoccur throughout her work toolkits, strategies, participatory games, partnerships with community based organizations and municipal agencies to realize a more equitable redistribution of land and resources. Her experimental visions and interactive processes are subversively radical in the way the rules are written in order to push back on the systems of privatization, profit, and disempowerment that have created the precarious conditions that many communities find themselves in. Besides co-directing the Urban Works Agency at California College of the Arts, where she is associate professor, and running her design firm, All of the Above, where she is the founding principal, Jeanette has written and edited, been awarded an Emerging Voices Award by the Architecture League in New York, been exhibited by the Rare Reform Center for the Arts at the Oslo Architecture Triennale, and by the um, MTA in New York, and has been featured on the Brian Lehrer Show, in Fast Company, in Metropolis Magazine. And so, coming in from Oakland, California, as our first lecturer in the LARC Energy Slash Futures Spring Lecture Series, Please join me in giving a big round of welcome to our speaker, Jeanette. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, somehow, I think during the pandemic, this like wormhole opened up between Oakland and Philadelphia, and I was like constantly on the phone with people in this room, being inspired by the work that's happening here. And I think we really have in common this interest in working on you know, the way that designers can have activist and um, kind of grounded impacts through the kind of gritty workings of, you know, decision making, um, policy decisions and so on. So I think together we will leave no spreadsheet unturned <laughs> and um, kind of work together. <laughs> so um, my talk today is called um, From Public Engagement to Collective Power. Um, and, you know, I think for many architects and urban designers, the call for public engagement has prompted town hall meetings, workshops, and many other techniques to try to fold public opinion into design work. But this work has also rightly been criticized for extracting knowledge and consent from communities without meaningfully sharing power or altering more systemic roots of injustice. Um, this is especially concerning in the face of climate change, which exaggerates long-standing inequities across race and class. So I would like to advocate for a shift from the term public engagement to collective power. Um, my goal is to empower communities to realize a more equitable redistribution of land, resources, and risk. So how does one do this? Um, I see a particular need to translate between the spatial and representational techniques that architects work on um, and um, the decision-making procedures in urban governance and the ecological and economic systems that drive them. And I think that doing this requires that architects focus on process as much as product, systems as well as buildings, um, and across disciplines um, as well as within the field. So over the past 20 years, um, and you've seen a, seen a list of projects here, um, I have assembled collaborations um, that I've really enjoyed working with, um, both within the field um, 
and across disciplines that involve housing policy, filmmaking, um, and perhaps most importantly, government agencies and community-based organizations that I've described here. Um, so currently this work takes, these, takes form in these two platforms that um, Nick mentioned. Um, one is that I run research and speculative projects through a research lab um, at uh, California College of the Arts um, called Urban Works Agency. And I co-direct this with um, Antje Steinmiller and Niraj Batia, along with associate directors Chris Roach and Julia Greenkrug, and many enormously thoughtful uh, student research assistants at CCA. Um, secondly, I run commissioned design work um, through my private practice, which is called All of the Above. Um, today, I'm going to focus um, almost entirely on urban works, uh, urban works projects, but I'll give you like a quick glimpse of a recent project um, that I did, um, which is a, de a design for a hotel in Sichuan, China, in partnership with Brett Snyder and Irene Cheng. Across all of these different definitions of my practice, my work translates between architecture and the politics of ecology. And this idea of translation is important to me because I think it engages and upholds the voices of all people who shape urban environments. Um, I've also been thinking about this idea of translation in relationship to my background as the child of Korean and Japanese immigrants to the US. And so I think like many people in the room, um, I've kind of always been translating across cultures, right, and continue to do so with my partners. So today I'd like to share with you a couple of projects that demonstrate two particular techniques of translation. Um, some are decision-making tools which enable urban constituents to imagine potential action and reach consensus. Others are design protocols, which shape buildings and landscapes to influence larger systems, such as wealth creation and climate adaptation. So let's start with decision-making tools. And with a board game um, I designed called In It Together that Nick mentioned earlier, um, this game was part of a design competition called the Bay Area Resilient by Design Challenge which asked 10 design teams from around the world to imagine how neighborhoods could adapt to rising seas. Um, I was part of a very large team called the All Bay Collective, which was led by AECOM, CMG Landscape, um, UC Berkeley's College of Environmental Design, and my research lab, Urban Works. Um, the team included architects, urbanists, engineers, biologists, landscape architects, and urban economists. Um, and we also partnered with Modem, with David Baker Architects, the Turner Center for Housing Innovation, um, Skio Solutions, and Sylvestrum Climate Associates. And I mention all these people not only because I want to kind of credit them and, and, sh and share my respect with them, but also because it's a reminder of the kinds of coalitions that we have to build to really tackle climate adaptation. Um, so we focused on the San Leandro Bay, which sits between the city of Oakland, which you can see on the right here, the Oakland Airport in the foreground, and an island city called Alameda. Um, and here, um, oh, did I miss something? Oh, that's strange. Sorry, I'm missing some slides. Anyway, um, here climate risk kind of extends across the neighborhood um, and um, intersects with a very deep legacy of injustice. Um, so we see here the history of the exodus of manufacturing jobs, redlining, the demolition of public housing, and predatory lending practices, which have systematically prevented its mostly Black and Latinx residents from instituting wealth creation and cultural continuity. Um, these pressures have only been accelerated by the surge in Bay Area housing costs and the departure of three professional sports teams from this kind of stadium complex here. Um, so in response, um, Oakland community groups have sought deep-seated change. Um, we formed partnerships with the community groups that you can see here, uh, which include the East Oakland Collective, the Oakland Climate Action Coalition, Planting Justice, and Repair Nations, as well as city and state agencies, um, such as the City of Oakland, East Bay Regional Parks District, and BART. Sorry for so much listing, <laughs> um, but it is important to mention them. Um, so 
you know, I think some of our partners were really ready and eager for shovel-ready designs, while others saw the idea of resilience as a kind of smokescreen for gentrification. And to navigate these very different, but I think equally legitimate perspectives, um, we set out to make a game to make it possible and, and really even fun to just air our difference and differences and guide our process. So um, I created this game in real time to prompt this, this process. Um, and we began by asking our partners to describe their priorities um, on these kind of blank stakeholder cards, which then ident uh, informed the identities and incentives for each of the game's players. Um, we then came back to the next meeting with a series of adaptation pieces. Um, and this included uh, flood mitigation strategies like a tidal pond or a living levee, as well as strategies for affordable housing, for example, um, or for a community land, uh, such as a community land trust. Uh, we debated their merits. Um, some, for example, argued that you could only have adaptation with big revenue generating programs. Others argued that wealth creation needed to be held within the hands of existing residents um, by, for example, co uh, cultivating collectively owned land or worker owned cooperatives. So with this feedback, I finalized the game board and the rules of the game. And I've since played it over 20 times at community meetings with our partners, at the BART station, um, with students, at planning conferences, and many other places. So I'll give you a taste of how it works, um, and I'll use a more recent kind of digital version of the game to do that. Um, the game simulates rising seas at the center of this kind of fictional city. Um, and there are six players um, who have some unique and some overlapping goals. Um, uh, they accomplish these goals by placing these adaptation tiles down on the board. Um, and then both the goals and the tiles are color coded. So for example, the tenant player is primarily focused on sociability and equity in pink and red. The developer player, as you can imagine, is focused on money, which happens in orange. Um, the homeowners are kind of mixed between profit and sociability. The animal is entirely focused on environment. And the mayor has a mixed set of goals with a slight tendency to favor profit. <laughs> um, and then the players can decide at any point whether they would prefer to play competitively or cooperatively. I've seen a very wide range of strategies emerge. Um, in this case, the mayor squeezed revenue from a unicorn tech campus downtown um, to pay for waterproofing and other locations. That's the kind of big development version. Uh, in another, the developer relocated housing downtown um, thanks to a kind of unlikely alliance with the animal player who was eager to reclaim that former land as a wetland. Um, in a third case um, that I think most closely approximated our East Oakland partners' goals, the tenant player convinced the homeowner to pump out flood water just long enough to build a community-owned solar farm that in turn paid in turn paid for larger scale adaptation um, incrementally. Um, in each case, I think the players could kind of roll the dice, see the floods rise, and test how their various proposals um, fared in, in kind of uncertain features. So throughout the challenge process, um, the game was especially useful at forging trust even across stakeholders with long-standing tensions. Uh, we did find some areas of consensus um, around, for example, the importance of wetland restoration and the utility of community benefits districts, which would basically pull funding from future development and bring it to, into the hands of community members. Other debates remained live um, and really unresolvable. And I think the debates that were trickiest had to do with like community ownership of land, energy, and resource, like infrastructural resources. At the very least, though, the game allowed us to keep the debates live. You know, a, a challenge in a competition like this has a tendency to get people to kind of smooth over their differences to lead to a, a known result. But I think here it was useful to just keep the, the disagreements active. Um, 
Our partners also reported that the game helped them empathize with each other and kind of expand their own pre pre preconceptions of what was possible. So in it together, especially focused on this idea of negotiating across differences. Um, I'd also like to share another climate change board game that I designed that I think asks even bigger questions about like how economies and relationships are formed in cities. And this game is called Barter Town. Um, it was commissioned by a state agency called the Bay Area Conservation and Development Commission, or BCDC. Um, and they used this game um, to kind of facilitate conversation with their other uh, agency partners. Um, since the initial version was released, I've also created variations of the game, such as these alternate pieces for exhibition at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Um, I made this human scale version that we played at the Housing the Human Festival in Berlin, and this floor version um, made for the Oslo Architecture Triennial that I now, I just like travel with this thing and play this game with people along the way. Um, okay, so Barter Town, is my sound okay? I feel like something adjusted. Barter Town imagines a world without money. So players basically perform daily activities around the board. They might go host a radio show or babysit for a friend. But when the floods come, players can get isolated and stuck in different zones around the build, uh, board. And to resolve this, the players have a kind of limited number of infrastructure tiles that they can use to waterproof areas or to build bridges across the water. So the players kind of debate how they want to use these tiles. They can decide to work together or individually. It just kind of depends on how the play is going. Um, and to make this kind of series of discussions even more poignant, um, each player has a unique power. Um, there are five players, a developer, a designer, a nomad, a caregiver, and a politician. So for example, the developer who you can see here has the power to seize buildings and um, charge other players to use them. The designer can draw new building envelopes around the board. Um, and the caregiver can give rides to other players and allow, allow other players to sleep in their home. <laughs> um, in over 12 game events I've played so far, almost every player has won more than once, which I think suggests a surprising parity even among very different skills. Um, in one event, which you can see here, um, the architect team sold out their skills to the developer agreeing to expand that person's property into a mega zone that only the two of them could use. Um, but grassroots strategies win too. Um, one time the caregiver player won, um, even in fact by the biggest margin to date, um, by carrying the other players everywhere he traveled and collaborating with them along the way. Um, and in the most cooperative play yet, all players together um, uh, built a commune in the hill and then protected this little zone downtown and kind of went back and forth between the two. <laughs> um, so architecturally, the game reveals how density, mixed use, and I think variously shaped enclosures can impact players' desires to work competitively or cooperatively. Um, and you know, I think ultimately Barter Town exists not necessarily to promote the idea of a barter society, but to reveal social dependencies that often get masked by our current economies. Um, so I think we currently assume that those with all the money have all the power, um, but Barter Town also re reveals that skills like generosity and flexibility can actually sort of hold their own even in the face of climate change. So here I'm reaching the end of my first section about decision-making tools. Um, I think these projects all, and I'm, I'm putting Underdome in this category, and Safari 7 as well. <laughs> Thank you for remembering the previous projects. Um, so I think all of these projects build on the legacy of public engagement with their emphasis on approachability and play and inclusion. Um, but I also believe that they take a step further in a couple of key ways. Um, they acknowledge conflict and thus facilitate, I think, a more difficult but important form of consensus. They reserve a seat at the table for those with different kinds of expertise, not just to participate, but to govern. They translate across dis distinct urban systems. Um, I like to think of these games as a kind of cross between an architect's model, an economist's model, and an ecologist's model in the way that they simulate um, interactions across these systems. 
Um, one of the biggest hurdles that I encountered in the RBD process was this kind of tendency to try to speak across mismatched languages. So, you know, people would be talking about efficiency or profit or performance and rights, but there's such a, the, this mismatch between these languages had a tendency to always form the language of efficiency and profit over the other stuff. And I, I believe, um, and I have experienced, that these games bring these languages into comparison. I think carving out space for terms of justice and rights just as much as profit and efficiency. Decision-making tools um, in, I'm sorry. <laughs> so if in the last section, decision-making tools develop a process of empowerment, um, I'd also like to talk about design protocols, which I believe shape the very spaces in which a just city can take hold. So I'll be returning to the Resilient by Design challenge, but now with a focus on our design proposal. Um, amidst, ah, this is where those slides went. <laughs> so here you can see some of the flood risk of the area, um, some of the housing history of, of uh, deep East Oakland and the kind of threats of gentrification to the area. So amidst these challenges, um, uh, our team's primary goal was to support adaptation without displacement. Um, part of our proposal, which you can see here, was to widen the edges of the waterfront to accommodate floods and to stitch neighborhoods back to the shore. Um, today, I'd especially like to focus on two strategies connected to this that we call tidal cities and resilient equity hubs. Um, and the landscape architect, Christina Hill, especially led this tidal cities work, which you can see here. Instead of resisting the inundation of water, this approach would create lagoons with medium density floating housing. Um, so neighborhoods could thus rise with the seas, they could filter pollutants in the stormwater, and importantly, they could withstand liquefaction in an earthquake. Um, in one of our earlier drawings, we imagined a kind of patchwork of tidal ponds that could be built on um, formerly industrial land and vacant publicly owned sites. Um, and these, um, you know, depending on the neighborhood, could be interspersed within existing neighborhoods. Um, amazingly, these lagoons alleviate groundwater pressure, not just in their immediate site, but in adjacent land as well. Um, so this would also help uh, uh, residents stay in place even as the neighborhood changes. So this is, I think, where the resilient equity hubs idea comes in, which um, I especially led with the urban economist Paul Penninger and architect Brad Lieben, um, formerly of David Baker Architects. So this approach would basically form alliances across city lines and across property boundaries. And as, at a neighborhood scale, especially um, this would an, involve the formation of community land trusts that could involve both wet and dry land within this kind of patchwork of tidal ponds. Um, as you may know, a, a CLT or community land trust um, is a structure that allows members to own land collectively and buildings individually. Um, so in a situation, I mean, that, that's literally what's happening here, right? It's that separation between building and land. Um, this would also help to distribute the burdens and advantages of both wet and dry land across the collective. So as flooding increases, for example, residents could directly govern an incremental process of change. Um, for example, they might decide that people in some flood prone areas need to move within the CLT but are still protected within this kind of community. Um, Importantly, also because CLTs restrict the resale value of land, housing would thus be taken off the speculative market and be kept permanently affordable. Um, spatially, I think we were also really excited by this, this kind of new combination between water and land, between new and old, um, and saw these, we saw these places as um, sites where re reciprocal relationships of care of each other and to the land can take hold. So over the past few years, I've been focusing on this relationship between property ownership and social justice. Um, I'm super excited about this. This is all I think about is property, <laughs> uh, precisely because I think property is the place, one great place where architects um, can connect directly to systems of power and wealth creation. Um, 
I think we might know from our own histories of settlement that the subdivision of land as private property has set the stage for colonization, resource extraction, and real estate speculation, dispossessing BIPOC communities and workers from their lives and livelihoods. And yet many of the same ideas behind ownership, ideas like the commons, inheritance, and maintenance can also redistribute wealth. They can sustain cultural continuity and foster environmental responsibility. So I'm currently working on a book called Property Playbook. Actually, I think I just had the title here. Property Playbook from Dispossession to Reciprocity. And um, you can see it's very fledgling, but you can see a couple of our illustrations of some of our case studies here. And the book presents 24 plays or strategies for reclaiming ownership that have been championed by community-based organizations across the United States. Um, so stay tuned for that. <laughs> um, and this is kind of a sidebar, but I also wanted to give you a very quick glimpse of a related project I'm also working on. And this is a board game called Mix and Match that helps community members um, design alternate strategies for property ownership um, and investment. Um, to, to understand how they, community members can create housing that works for them, for this greater community. Um, I'm currently, totally currently designing this game um, with uh, an architect named Tyler Pugh, who's a, also a kind of community leader in the, the, um, the rebuilding process of a town called Greenville, California. Um, so Greenville, as some of you might know, um, is a small town in the Sierra Nevadas that almost entirely burned down in a wildfire three years ago. So our goal with this game is to help community members un understand how to rebuild housing, most importantly, affordable housing, in a way that is extremely difficult with the market, like market challenges there today. So to give you a sense of how this works, players can basically mix and match these tool cards, which define things like funding sources, ownership structures, construction methods, and living arrangements. So if you wanted to be kind of normal about it, you could like pick a conventional 30-year mortgage and build a single family home, but like we all know what that looks like. <laughs> um, or maybe you could combine crowdfunding with limited equity restrictions, um, which is maybe similar to some examples I was talking about before, um, which would capture local wealth to create permanently affordable housing. Or maybe you could combine in incremental growth with sweat, sweat equity cards to create pathways to ownership for people who provide their labor and love rather than their cash down payment. <laughs> um, so this is a little bit of a departure from the design protocols section of this talk, but I thought I'd kind of bring it in here because it, it works in parallel to the property book. Um, Nick Pesner and I are organizing a workshop this Saturday um, where we're going to play the game and just like talk with you all about the possibilities of property ownership. So I, I really hope you'll join. I think it'll be really fun. Um, so this will be Saturday afternoon. And if you'd like to join, we still have some spots available. Um, there's a sign up sheet at the back, somewhere back there. Uh, please join. Okay. So as a last section of this talk, um, I thought I would take a deeper dive into one particular case study that I will cover in the book. Um, and this case study is the Esther's Orbit Room in West Oakland. This is the last remaining venue of the West Coast blues scene in West Oakland. And Esther's was purchased in 2021 for $1.4 million by a group called the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, or EBPREC. Um, and in their words, they purchased this site to create a home for black arts and culture keepers. Um, I'm a member owner of EVPREC myself, um, and I've, um, over the past couple of years, I've been studying their as-built drawings and all the paperwork, and I've been following a design process um, that's led by the architects June Grant and Loman McNamara. Um, I published this this research in the anthropology journal Public Culture, and then I just exhibited some visographically printed drawings at the Seoul Biennial of Architecture and Urbanism this past September. So if you want to dig into this work, um, it's out there in, the, in those formats. Um, and my intention in studying this was to compare E.B. Preck's very inventive forms of ownership with the spatial arrangement of Esther's orbit room 
to basically better understand how buildings can play a role in supporting collective ownership. So the drawings begin with a look back at the property um, history and systems behind uh, Esther's own, like below Esther's own footprint. Um, this land, as you can see in some of these images here, was seized from its original occupants, the Lisjan Ohlone people, by Spanish colonizers. It was granted in 1820 to a soldier named Luis Miral, uh, Maria Peralta, who was praised for suppressing Ohlone uprisings at the Mission San Jose, just to the south. Um, the land was seized again in 1850 by these three Americans who squatted the land and had the audacity to go out and hire a surveyor to plat out properties that they did not own. <laughs> they sold subleases without the legal right to do so, but the city of Oakland eventually verified these claims, asserting that those who, quote unquote, improve the land's economic productivity should have the right to it. So I think Oakland's property lines, like many property lines, um, were really legitimized by force and by racially charged ideas of value as much as it was by systems of uh, legal and bureaucratic systems. Um, and I think it's important to remember how physical this work is. Um, property systems result not just from like drawing clean lot lines, but through the brutal erasure of Olone sub summer settlements and by the leveling of this wetland. So to counteract this, E.B. Preck purchased the Orbit Room to return it to BIPOC people whose lives and livelihoods have been extracted by property systems. So at the top of this drawing, you can see how E.B. Preck raised money from nonprofits and small contributions by local grassroots investors. Um, it then caps rents and resale values to take land permanently off the speculative market um, in other words, it basically combines features of crowdfunding with a community land trust. Um, and in this way, and it, it kind of flips the Wall Street way of working, which is sort of suggested by the drawing, um, and it's kind of redirecting wealth away from Wall Street back towards local capture. Both past and present, this property has been both a site of protection and expansion. Um, so in architectural terms, you could probably say that Esther's is both an enclave and a network. Um, so let's start with the network side of things. 70 years ago, Esther's was a node in, an, in a kind of local economy built around railroads and the Port of Oakland. This involved rooming houses, supper clubs, clubs, um, and even the very first African-American labor union in the United States, um, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which was located just down the street from Esther's. Um, 7th Street especially supported BIPOC businesses who had been excluded from setting up shop in downtown Oakland. Um, and here we mapped some of the business names that we found in phone books dating back to the 1900s. Um, in the 60s, however, 7th Street struggled as deindustrialization, redlining, and urban renewal projects erased entire swaths of the neighborhood. Um, so you can see here a shift from the pink, um, which marks the 1950s footprints, to blue, which um, reflects the 2003 footprints. And this drawing was inspired by one done by Walter Hood in his book, um, Urban Diaries. So Esther survived thanks to the stability offered by private property. Um, and in this sense, Esther's is kind of an enclave. It's a site of protection. Um, owning title to land allowed Esther Mabry, who you can see here, um, to sustain her club from 1959 until her death in 2010. <laughs> um, Noni Session, who is the executive director of E.B. Preck, describes Esther's as a protected space where, quote, black and brown people can come without having to justify their presence, unquote. This kind of constant tension between protection and expansion, I think, is also visible in the architectural arrangement of the space. So Esther's is, in fact, made of four different properties that were connected together over the years. Um, these two buildings, for example, were especially conjoined in a way that engulfed 
formerly exterior spaces within. <laughs> um, so here you can see the dining room that was added on at the back of the bar. Um, and here you can see um, through the wood siding what used to be an exterior um, alleyway, which has now become an interior hallway. Um, the, these kind of re-enclosures um, uh, started to kind of redirect circulation no longer from the sidewalk to the back of the lot and now more like side to side across the, the lot lines. This allowed Esther Mabry to multitask. <laughs> she cooked breakfast, lunch, and dinner. She mixed cocktails. She hosted performers ranging from Etta James to MC Hammer. <laughs> and I like to imagine, for example, how light from the disco ball in the bar would have kind of fallen onto the yellow laminate counters in the dining table in the back. And this is a kind of side-by-side -side adjacency in Esther's that I think is an especially good fit for E.B. Preck's own innovative gover governance structure. Um, E.B. Preck is a, 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 it's a model that's based on existing ownership models, but in, in itself, it is a kind of novel um, arrangement. And it's especially good at assembling diverse owners. Um, so this diagram shows their governance structure. Um, and in this bubble here, you see four types of owners that can participate in EBPREC. Um, to, and EBPREC set this up this way in order to kind of reverse profit motives and uphold local interests and kind of stave off the tendency for investors to get the upper hand. Okay, so the four kinds of owners are investor owners who contribute money, community owners who contribute local knowledge, resident owners who live there and make this space happen, and staff owners who contribute their labor. Um, no matter how much you contribute or what you contribute, every member has one vote um, to kind of reinforce their power. Um, in addition to this, over here you can see the board members, and um, EB Prec basically reserves particular board seats for appointment by partner organizations. So there's one board seat that's dedicated to, for example, um, the Black East Bay director, another focused on the indigenous director who is, for example, appointed by a sister organization, which is called the Segorite Land Trust, which is run by Olone people. So there's a kind of reservation of power among these um, kind of uh, like sister groups. Um, Okay, so what does this mean? This side-by-side -side aggregation um, is one that we also see spatially. So um, the architect Lowen McNamara made this design for E.B. Preg, which would basically demolish the central structure, which had been for a long time a storehouse and in fact has a lot of structural problems. Um, and then they're gonna replace that central building with this kind of open breezeway where now activities, labor, and resources can pool to, together among owners. Um, at Esther's, um, especially E.B. Preck expects that profit from this bar, which is a for-profit business, um, can subsidize other co-owners on the site, which include like a movement studio, um, a gallery, and artist housing upstairs. Um, E.B. Preck will basically renovate Esther's orbit room to a kind of warm shell level of completion uh, which means that it's just like uh, 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 fine, uh, <laughs> um, refined enough um, so that the um, tenants can come in and build out and change the space over time without having to worry about plumbing and energy and things like that. Um, so here beneath this kind of singular gray colored set of asphalt shingles and wood siding, we see, I think, kind of one building, right? One unified enclave, but we also see a kind of village of partners. We also see a porous landscape into this network of West Oakland. And what I love about this project, I think, is that it's, it's all of these things at once. Um, at this kind of coincidence of a network and an, and an enclave within the same space is important because it gives its owners the ability to negotiate and adapt in relationship to these different spatial conditions. Um, the, this community of owners can decide for themselves when and where they want to reach out and when and where they want to enclose and retreat. So 
I've called this work Design Protocols to emphasize that design shapes rituals and procedures as well as the literal physical spaces themselves. Um, these spaces define intimate social experiences in a way that can impact much larger ecological and economic systems, such as self-governance, wealth creation, climate adaptation, and resource access. So I began this talk with a critique of public engagement as something that struggles to alter the systemic roots of injustice. And I hope that you can see how these decision-making tools make change possible and how design protocols can make change inhabitable. Um, in this way, I hope that design can play one small part <laughs> um, in this process of amplifying collective power. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, and we have time for some questions and we have a microphone. So raise your hand and pass the mic. Hi, Jeanette. Thank you um, so much for all your work. My name is Gabe. Um, I'm a first year here. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask a question because, like, how do you see making light of systems that can be sometimes violent? through a game can really impact the result. And like I'm not trying to say that that's a bad thing. Like, I see that there's a brilliant thing, but I'm just interested to hear your, your response to that. Yeah, I think um, it's such an interesting question. Um, I could imagine there are probably many topics we could all name that probably shouldn't be made light of. But I do find that within my experience, the people who play my games are just like relieved to have a chance to talk frankly about things that are so repressed in a way. And so I've been to a number, I'm sure we've all been <laughs> to a number of community meetings that are either like overly polite or overly contentious, right? And it's like neither is very helpful. And it, the, the overly polite ones is like, ah, oh, like we don't even know how to talk about our disagreements because we're so afraid of, of isolating ourselves and, and horrifying others. <laughs> and, and then on the other side, right, the kind of um, oppositional approaches kind of leave people st equally stranded. As I find that the games make it easier to just like laugh a bit and, and be able to just come out and be like, you know what, we disagree and it's okay, you know? Um, or in many cases, people will role play, so they'll, they'll, they'll be asked to play something that somebody they're not, and so it's, it makes it easier to kind of imagine the, the incentives and motivations of this character and then talk about those differences with others. So I, I find that in like, at least in the, the urban disagreement context, <laughs> it's been enormously helpful. Thanks for your question. Hi, Jeanette. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I have a question about um, the word coalition. Um, I think it's just uh, the coalition building is something I've heard in a lot of contexts. And um, so I'm wondering for you, like when you use the word coalition, uh, like when when you say like, okay, I'm building coalitions, what does that mean for you? And what does that mean for the people you're working with? And when does that word help? And when does that word seem to come up against some frictions? Super interesting. I don't think I use the word coalition. I think I use the word consensus, perhaps more often. Um, totally correct me. <laughs> um, I, um, you know, I think I have a particular focus on what I've been calling accidental collectives. Um, and really, one of the things that, one of the many things that's incredibly charged about climate risk is that it affects people who otherwise do not see themselves in a community with other people, right? Um, so you might say, I belong to this community, but in fact, like this flood risk or this wildfire risk affects people who have very different uh, physical conditions, very different socioeconomic lives, and so on. And so I find it fascinating that some of these um, risks and pressures require all communities to speak with communities they don't normally talk to. And I think it's that, that discomfort of talking with people that are very kind of outside your coalition <laughs> um, to be really important and productive. And I know we live in an incredibly charged political world right now. I feel like I started this work about decision making way before Trump and now it's all very different. <laughs> but um, 
I, I think a lot of my work is focused on the idea of learning how to speak with people that you do not think you have things in common with. Um, that being said, I, I'm all for people who work in coalitions and for coalitions. And I know a lot of the property arrangements that I'm looking at um, do really focus within an internal community and they find strength in doing that. So I think both are important, but um, I just don't want to lose sight of the accidental collective by focusing on the intentional collective. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Pina, and um, I'm just curious about um, kind of building on what Paul was just asking how, um, when you were working on the, um, the Green Greenfield project, I believe, um, how that sort of played out in terms of um, being in a rural area, more remote area, yeah. and this whole notion of you know, collective power or co coalition whatever is sort of descriptive to the model of science theater. Yeah. That's that's one discussion, but then ultimately I'm very curious about sort of um, building those bridges um, across different areas of identification with perhaps different goals and different um, sort of socioeconomic or sociocultural challenges. Absolutely. Um, it's been so interesting. So I guess the backstory of that project is that um, uh, the efforts to rebuild Greenville after the Dixie Fire have been primarily led by this group called the Dixie Fire Collaborative. And, and within that group, there's this architect, Tyler, Tyler Pugh. And Tyler Pugh is actually an alum of, of CCA, California College of the Arts, where I teach. And so he, after the fire, he came to us and said, we, we want to work with you and get design ideas about how this community can, can respond. And so we've been working with them over two years to kind of develop a, a whole, whole, we've done I think six different studios across like five different faculty member, members looking at these problems of, of reconstruction and recovery. And I know Nick has worked with them as well. Um, really great work. <laughs> um, so anyway, this partnership has been going on for quite a little bit, little while now. And really just a couple of weeks or months ago, Tyler and I started to create this game um, to help uh, uh, a nonprofit group called the Almanor Foundation work with local uh, property owners and other nonprofits to figure out how to rebuild housing that the market is just simply not producing. So, you know, some kinds of housing are going up um, through due, uh, due to settlement money and things like that, but others just is just it's not financially viable. And so, anyway, we're creating this game and. It's just so interesting because this is a red county. People in this city and this town voted for Trump. They do not want to talk about coalition building. <laughs> they do not want to talk about communal living um, and collective resource building and stuff. They want to talk about independence. They want to talk about um, beauty of open space. But at the same time, the market's not working for that, right? And so like talking to people in that context, it's fascinating because What's amazing is that everybody recognizes that it's not working, and they're actually super eager to find other strategies. So um, actually, just the other day, Nick and I like added some values in that were like, Ugh. we we uh, we made some design criteria that were focused more on Greenville, and then I was like, hmm, if we bring this game to Philadelphia, they're going to be totally different questions. <laughs> so we could talk about that another time. But anyway, basically, I'm finding that a lot of our community partners in Greenville are really excited about things like. Um, uh, crowdfunding structures and um, but kind of like an ADU structure where an existing landowner still maintains an individual property, but they can start to build like ADU clusters across properties that um, can build like a village like, you know, uh, new urban density. So I, I think that stuff's really exciting because you like there are ways to now break down ownership, and make it more accessible to people who aren't currently but it actually really works with people's ideas of independence and like actually market-driven um, investment. Thanks for the question. Hi, uh, sorry, I was a little late to the party, so you might have this. But uh, to what degree uh, are the games you've conceived of, I mean, I understand that they're 
to the end of uh, settling on certain disposition and creation of assets, resources. To what degree are they heuristic for ongoing or long term stewardship of the same? And how does that kind of factor, you know, how does that extend over time? And, you know, I realize that this is kind of a methodology that people come together and, and, and come to some sort of agreement, but is there latent in it sort of different approaches to long term stewardship? I guess is the question. Yeah, that's a great question. By the way, it's really nice to meet you. We've had many Zoom meetings, and it's really nice to meet you in person. <laughs> um, um, maybe there are a couple ways to answer that. One is within the space of the game itself. Um, so, I mean, games are just so good at playing out chance, right? So, um, uh, one thing we do is like think through the cycles of a game in relationship to actual physical time. Um, and with climate change, it's almost like you could have one round that's like six months, the second round could be five years later, the third round could be like 20 years later. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Like, you, so you can use the game to like kind of scope out like possible futures. Um, and for example, if within it together, um, um, I worked with a, a, um, a climate engineer to just look through the odds of like how much the seas might rise and then tie that to the time cycles of the game. So in that way, it's like we're kind of previewing that, um, that long-term maintenance, that long-term stewardship. Um, another way though, maybe to answer the question is that my biggest hope for the games is that they can become embedded into a long-term decision-making process that um, communities are a part of. So if we tend to think of community process as like, we hold a public meeting and people come draw on whiteboards and then, <laughs> and then the design happens and people go home, you know. Um, I, I would love to see a kind of process where people who have all different kinds of expertise can be a continual part of a decision-making process that community-based organizations hold, right? So in Deep East Oakland, after the challenge, one of our community partners, which is called the East Oakland Collective, um, got a really major state grant to do a community-driven resilience planning process. And then, um, and so this was like, I think a much more grassroots governance process than I think the challenge allowed for. And they're continuing to get funding to kind of keep updating this process. So I say that to reference the idea that um, Grassroots power can be instituted in long-term ways, exactly like Jay is doing. <laughs> um, and that then if that is true, then the question becomes like, how do people with just like no knowledge of climate science, but tons of knowledge of community power enter into the conversation? And so my hope is that the games will keep playing a role in like inviting people in. And then you could be like, oh, I played that three years ago. You know, let's let's play it again now with new variables on the table. So I have a question. What are your favorite board games and which ones inspire you uh, in your own game making and why? I have to admit that I am not a huge board game player. <laughs> <laughs> I like a lot. So, um, but I'm very influenced by other board games that architects have made. Um, and so, if you want to know more about that, look at Mark Vasudo. I was really influenced by Kazi Svarnelis's um, games. No, no, no. Kazi Svarnelis designed um, a board game with um, Jochen Hart in it. And they did the work with um, Sparta and Jim Sharon. The game is really smart and really complex. And um, Nathan came in and played it with my students. I, I taught at Columbia for many years. So we played the game there together. And um, I just got very influenced by that and started making games with students. And I saw it as a kind of theoretical built tool that I think is useful for all designers. Um, but in a way that is, I think, a lot more fun than I've seen scenario planning to be. Um, so yeah, those are my influences. Um, I also have a question about the game. So my initial question is, who is the players? Who are the players, and how did you recruit them to play the game? Are they representative enough? Well, I mean, if the people who represent the developer 
is to see a real developer in real life, and you said some of them are just role players. So see, they are just guessing or imagine uh, the, what the role they represent is thinking, how would you utilize the outcome, the disagreement arising during the game to inform your design? Absolutely, that's such a great question. Um, in the in the RBD challenge, um, I think the game players were very much the players themselves. Um, so uh, people in the East Oakland Collective played the game. People in um, the whole design team had kind of like worked through these parts of the game to test it themselves. Um, there were some cases. Sorry, let me try, try, try to figure out how to answer your question. So there were some cases where. I think role playing someone other than, uh, let me start that sentence again. In that situation where the people who were playing the game were the actual community members being represented, I found it to be most useful to ask them to role play others than themselves because it helped them just like step outside of the same disagreements and like kind of open up more playful uh, outcomes. Um, and I think it's important to pair that with moments where they actually do represent themselves because, of course, they might be frustrated by having to play somebody else, right? So maybe both of those things have to happen at the same time. Um, there were also moments where, you know, it's funny, like, I think you're supposed to come out here and say, well, the, the game was really useful because it got community members to think again. I actually thought one of the most useful things was that it got the design team to think differently. <laughs> and like one of the tricky things is that experts think they have all the answers, right? So there were like so many times where like people on our design team, like me included, you know, you come in and like you think you know what the right answer is. But I'd have ask, I would, my favorite thing to do is to ask people to play the same game twice because they get all their first conceptions, their preconceptions out of the way, the first gameplay. And then the second time they have to like, I don't know, like think of a new idea. And so there were many times where I saw the experts have to play the game twice and then be like, Ooh, what do I do? <laughs> and the second time they played, they would have to like push themselves and, and their own preconceptions. So anyway, there's I think in terms of that, that those were some of my biggest lessons by playing it with folks. Um, I've also learned many other things. Like I've played games like Barter Town. I've played in various cities around the U.S. in Berlin and Oslo, uh, in in the U.K. And I have very much seen a lot of cultural differences in different places. And it's like I went in, I'm sorry, these are all really stereotypes, but like in Oslo, people were so communally driven. They were so interested in collective rights. I went to Santa Barbara and it was just like mayhem. <laughs> and that was the developer designer partnership. Um, and then it, so anyway, there's that, sorry. And then the third answer to your question is, I had this wonderful moment in Berlin when we played the full size Brighter Town where um, my, my host got like local actual people to play themselves. So there was a, a developer playing the developer, uh, uh, an actual communal liver live as the uh, caregiver. And then there was a, an, a local mayor who played the mayor or the, the politician. And I was amazed because every other time I've seen the politician get played, the politician character always comes out and is like kind of like dogmatic and like kind of dictatorial. But this person who was the mayor and was actually playing the politician was like everything but. He like barely said anything. He was like constantly listening to people and like being like tying that person to that person. And it just gave me so much respect for the art of governance, actually. But yeah, thanks for your question. Hello, Jennifer. Hi, Emma. Nice to see you. Um, I have a, I'm from the Consumer Conservation Project, and I'm just so interested in the institution. And I have a question about game SEO. Um, as you said, uh, uh, when we think about design games, um, for when I was demonstrating to design rules and design architecture and design uh, character's agenda, a developer knows me as a designer bias that when you're in designer's role, that it affects your 
how to design characters and how to design people to use. And that's that, that's the result of the game. Um, that's really interesting. I think that's just like always the dance of designing games because in a way you always want a rule set because like, I don't know, like one creates rules and boundaries. Almost all games have limited resources. So in a way you could say that games are kind of like this awful thing <laughs> because they're reproducing like a, a culture of scarcity, right? Um, and yet at the same time, those parameters are the very things that, in, that invite people to have to work together, that invite compromise or exchange. And so that, that for me is always like the push and pull uh, of that rule set. And so anyway, I think what I try to do with that, I kind of always have that in the back of my mind. And then when I design a game, I'll often try to design the constraints based on what I think cities have, like if cities have constraints of tax income and time, time scales and um, the, you know, just how hard it is to get something built, uh, I try to reflect those realities. But then I also just try to pick at like, what are those terms of scarcity that are so annoying that we shouldn't take for granted, you know? And so I think that for me, for example, um, Bartertown originally started without the individual character uh, identities, the powers. And I started to feel frustrated because I felt like the game was too reflective of the constrained world we lived in. <laughs> and I, so then I designed the character powers to try to like push against the economic logic of scarcity, basically, and allow generosity and kindness and all those powers to kind of come in. So I hope I'm answering your question. Um, <laughs> but also to your second point, um, it's true, like, uh, I have started to add features to the game that allow people to change their goals. Um, so, or just to be f nimble and flexible, right? Like, uh, in, in it together, excuse me, there's a, a policy card, um, there's, like a, there's a little skill card that allows the players to change their goals. So if you started out being a developer that only cared about profit, you could like replace some of your profit goals with like sociability goals. Um, or similarly, like the animal player starts with a particular territory, but they're animals, so like they can migrate, like the, so their their territory can keep moving around and stuff. So yeah, like flexibility would hopefully allow me to get past some of my biases as a designer. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, and I saw Billy's hand, so Billy, please. Uh, hi, Jeanette. Um, so this was great. So thank you so much for this. Um, I have a question about like failures to the game, right? And in fact, this is partially like my family is competitive and weird about games, so my dad like cheats when we play. My partner will like put forth the word she loses too much. Um, but I'm curious if you have any like you know fun stories about that, and also like out of that, what made you changed about the gameplay or the board? Or when you think about the game as like a method for getting to it. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, no one has flipped over the board. Um, I guess I don't know if anyone has cheated. Um, hmm. It's okay if the answer is no. I guess it's much nicer than my family. <laughs> I don't know. I think 
Well, I have a friend who's a board game designer, um, who's like a true actual board game designer who makes, you know, games that go to market for like holiday presents for families, you know. So he's someone who, in other words, my games are more, more educational. They're a bit more about like testing the concepts rather than being able to be played 200 times and still be fun on the 200th time. So that friend, um, whenever he plays my games, he like Im immediately breaks them. Um, and he'll like find the loopholes or he'll find points of scarcity and just like totally exploit them. Like in Barter Town, there are only three stores and like everybody needs the stores. And so when he was the developer, he just bought up all the stores and then, and so it's just things like that where I'm like, oh God, like I didn't see that coming. And, but that's not exactly failure. It's more just like he's understanding the logical loopholes of the thing. Um, if there are kind of, maybe a more cataclysmic form of failure to me would be that it uh, maybe formed tension in, in a room that where we didn't want more tension. That would, that to me, I would consider that to be a, a failure. Um, luckily, I have never encountered that. Um, oh, I did, I was at one community event where like some people were standing on the side and, and I was like, what are you doing? And they're like, I don't like games. <laughs> but I got them to join. <laughs> I think they had fun. <laughs> right, thank you for your tough question. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, wonderful questions. Um, it's also reminding me that uh, in the set of uh, Fire Studios that Jeanette and I have been kind of um, handshaking off and handing off to one another between CCA and Penn, uh, one of the final outcomes of this past um, spring semester was a board game designed by Oliver, Kaz, and Elliot um, for really? forest policy and oh, forest thinning to educate people about wildfires. So I think does it have trees in it? Absolutely. And <laughs> small little skitter logos. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the gospel goes for it. So uh, I believe there's a, a reception downstairs, so everyone should come have a drink and some bites. Um, and I think uh, we have spots for about you know, 10 to yeah. 15 people. Sign so whoever yeah. signs up first um, and wants to come on Saturday, 2 to 4, to play this beta version of uh, Mix and Match. We'll be in the lower gallery. And I uh, hope uh, you'll all join me in giving a very uh, thank you, Ann, to the